Mining for Molecular Function from a Universe of Knowledge, presented by Dr. Justin Siegel, Associate Professor of Chemistry, Biochemistry, and Molecular Medicine at UC Davis. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Steve Brown. I'm Associate Director of AFIS, AI Institute for Next Generation Food Systems. And uh, we are pleased to host this uh, Next in Line, our speaker series. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Justin Siegel. He's the faculty director for the IIFH Innovation Institute for Food and Health, and also professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and molecular medicine, and an associate director of the UC Davis Genome Cin uh, Center, as well as the uh, Graduate School of Management uh, visiting professor in entrepreneurship. So with that said, I will uh, introduce uh, Justin Siegel. Welcome. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. This is great. Uh, this is a great seminar series, and it's really exciting to be talking. I um, I can't believe so many people are actually like here in person in the summer. I had no idea this series actually happened in the summer, but it took a pause. <laughs> so it sounds like there's a good crowd online. But then, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so it's kind of a, a fun experience for me. I decided to change things up a little bit today. Normally, uh, my lab, generally speaking is in, for the last 10 and actually for the last 30 years of my career has been really focused around biomolecular discovery of biomolecular function and what we can what molecule bio, biomolecules we can discover what we can do with them and how they can hopefully impact the world um, most of the time when i give talks it's about the molecules we discovered and how we're deploying them into either the therapeutics industry the tools industry the food industry the materials industry the energy industry or various other places we've applied these biomolecules. Um, but for APHIS, uh, the project that we've been working on is more about the process of discovering those molecules. And how do you go from idea to that first discovery? And how do you leverage new and developing tools for that? So I thought I'd shift up a little bit today and we, we would talk about that. And, and very frankly, um, Ian uh, in the back, uh, back here, can't see him online, but he's back there. We might call him up at some point. <laughs> uh, really did all the work uh, today. And so I'm really just representing and providing some context uh, to the work that he's uh, doing and uh, has done and is currently doing. Um, before we get into that, I think it's important to understand where we're coming from and zoom out a little bit to understand why do we even care about biomolecular function? And very frankly, every one of you, every single day, everyone you know, every single day is impacted by biomolecules that have been discovered and then deployed into the industry and in various industries that we talked about. And I say, what is a biomolecule? It's a protein, it's RNA, it's a cell, it's a, it's a piece of biology that we've identified and understood that we, hey, we want to use this function in a way that's useful for humanity. And is that now the number over the last 20 years, biomolecules have become the number one form of therapeutics across the board. Um, whether it ranges from uh, Ozempic or CAR T cells or vaccines or anti-cancer drugs or any, any indication that you look at, it is currently a biomolecule that's driving it. Same in the materials industry. If you ever washed your clothes, I think you have all washed your clothes at some point. If you ever wondered why, huh, when I throw in the laundry machine, the stains actually come out, but if I actually scrub it by hand, it doesn't come out that well unless I use really special soap. Well, there's biomolecules that have been discovered and put into your industry detergents that break down those grass stains and the lipids and the fat and the, and the proteins and the glycans that solubilize and allow the washing machine to get rid of all that dirt and grime and smell. So it's that's why it's the line, but the, just the detergents actually is the scroll function that's happening in there. It's biology and washing machine. And that's true across all or just just yeah. every industry you think of. And finally, uh, in the food industry, probably most important at all, of all for this, for this group, in the food industry, pretty much everything you eat, at some point, a, a biomolecular function is discovered and deployed into the industry, um, is impacting your food, whether it's the bread you eat, if you've ever yeah. wondered why the bread you make at home goes stale really quickly, but the bread you buy in a grocery store stays nice and fresh. It's not chemicals. It's biomolecules changing the molecular structure of the bread to allow it to stay nice and soft. If you've ever eaten cheese, we don't harvest rennet anymore from horses' stomachs. We go make that. We've got to identify that biomolecular function. We harvest that molecule from microbial um, uh, fermentation systems 
and then apply that to the cheese. It's not, we don't have to go kill the animals anymore for that. And the list goes on and on and on. I could literally be here all day talking about different applications. So it's a huge multi-trillion dollar industry at this point and growing. And if we think about how do we find biomolecular function, the central dogma is here. Biology is defined by DNA. That's the blueprint. That DNA defines how do you take material in the world and convert that material into proteins. So that DNA sequence defines a protein sequence. That a protein sequence defines the structure of a protein. And that structure of a protein defines the function. So that biomolecular function protein. What we really care about truly as humanity is that function, that end point. But we have to go from the DNA. We can't just magically click and have that function in our hands. Biology works through DNA. So somehow we have to go from the DNA to the protein, to the structure to get to that function at the end. And that has been a challenge for the last hundred years that we've been making consistent progress at developing tools to work faster through this. Some of the biggest breakthroughs happened in the early 21st century where we solved that first step of how do you go from protein, from DNA to protein. We, through DNA sequencing and synthesis, we're able now to read and write DNA sequences in a cost-effective, commoditized way, making it such that now I can have an undergrad type in a sequence on a computer, hit order, and they can go it for $100, and two weeks later, it shows up on their doorstep. You know, that used to be multiple PhDs' efforts to get that DNA sequence. And then even to figure out what DNA sequence, they can go online and read databases of billions of different naturally occurring sequences because we've been reading the world of biology so much over the last 20 years. So there was this massive paradigm shift that happened in the early 21st century that quote unquote solved. And I say solved because nothing's ever solved. <laughs> still, there are still advances to be made in how do we work and manage protein, uh, DNA? How do we improve efficiency of synthesis, drop the cost? But it's pretty, when I can say a high school student can do this in a couple of weeks for a hundred bucks, pretty accessible at this point. It's not quite the cost of a Starbucks coffee. Um, I'm pretty sure it will get there within our lifetime. But we don't have to wait for that. We can do things with that now. So I'm going to put a check saying, if you want to go, if you know the protein sequence you want, and you want biology to make that protein sequence for you, that has that biomolecular function, it that's a solved problem at that point. This is not multi-decades of research. You're ready to go. And the question is, what protein sequence do you want? Right, what do you want to that DNA to encode? And this is a massive challenge. The space for protein sequences is astronomical. And I say that in a literal way. The number of protein sequences, if you think of an average protein, it's 400 residues long. That means 400 amino acids strung together on the pearls of, on a pearl of a string. And there's 20 natural amino acids. We're going to simplify it. We're not going to go with the, the post-translational modifications or the the, you know, the rare amino acids or anything. We're just going to say there's 20 just to simplify it. So that's 20 times 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 400 times, right? So we're just going to simplify it further. That's roughly 10 to the 400. We're just going to round it down by orders of magnitude. <laughs> 10 to the 400. The number of stars in the observable universe is 10 to the 24th. So it's like beyond astronomical. The difference though is unlike Elon Musk, where I'd have to go build a spaceship to go to a planet, and it'll take several lifetimes, most likely, to get to many of these planets. Like I just said, as soon as I know the protein sequence I want, I can have a student or a child type it into a computer. I guess that would be child labor. So don't do the child. <laughs> so just a student. We'll stop there. <laughs> stop, they'll type it into the computer. They'll hit order and for a couple hundred to maybe $500, depending on the size, the number of the size of that protein, it'll show up on their doorstep. So I can get to any of these planets instantaneously. But which ones? So that means you have to go to figure out that going, oh, we, we knew this function, we can go all the way back, we can get there. So if there was a huge, massive breakthrough in 2021, really driven by Google and DeepMind, um, where they applied cutting edge AI tools to break open that protein to structure gap. If we knew the protein sequence, 
how do you get to that structure? Because if we, that's one step closer to function, right? There was a massive breakthrough where basically a field that had been developing, this is a competition looking at that field over the last 20, 30 years. Um, it had been growing steadily in accuracy of going from sequence to structure and kind of leveled off. And the big spike you see here is that breakthrough technology where basically it goes from a fuzzy picture of what that protein structure might look like to a crystal clear picture. And you can actually see where the errors are and the defects are versus where, hey, that's a very accurate production. Um, this was backed and enabled because of those advances in that first step. The only reason Google DeepMind could do this is because over the last 20 years, since that DNA revolution had happened, we went from DNA to protein, we were able to catalog in a standardized machine readable way, 150 million protein sequences. We're at billions now. But back then, you know, in 2020, not that long ago, 150 million. And 150 million of those sequences corresponding to 70,000 structures. So now we had large data sets where we could connect sequence to structure. And it wasn't hundreds or thousands. We were in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. So you could start applying cutting edge neural networks and other deep learning tools where it wasn't just purely physics based models anymore and a lot of human intuition built there. So I'm not going to go deeply into how they did it, but that's basically what happened is you had all these 150 million sequences. You could figure out how the language of that sequence corresponded to the structure of that protein. And through basically neural networks that AlphaFold developed, we were able to convert a sequence into a structure and know very accurately where it was, the structure was accurate and where it was inaccurate, which is really critical when you're thinking about function. Is that part of the protein of the functional interest accurate or is it not accurate? It gives you confidence in what's happening. So that's just a couple of years ago in 2020, um, 2021, depending on when you look at it, that protein to structure problem of that step, we're going to say is solved. I'm not the only one saying it's solved. And again, I'll give the caveat. It's never truly solved. There's still protein crystallography. There's a lot of mysteries left in that protein to structure world. And there was another nature paper out earlier this year from Google DeepMind talking about how do you do multi-merit or interfaces of structure and building up that next step. But it, if you look at how many labs and how many groups in the world operate today, all the low hanging fruit that was sitting there, it's pretty much solved. There's a lot, lot, lot of opportunities to go after now. So now we're down to that one last key step. And that right now over the last couple of years is where the world is focused. And it's not just, I'm not just like, I'm saying the world is focused, but, um, you don't have to believe me as a professor in an ivory tower talking about, hey, this is an interesting esoteric topic that might or might not be relevant. This is literally happening. And it's the biggest, it's the literal biggest thing happening in the world right now. So I thought it'd be interesting just over the last six months to collect a couple news articles of companies that were funded to do explicitly this effort to connect that structure to function. So a few months ago or a few weeks ago, Zara or Zara, I think, rhymes with Thera. So they, Zara, they have a whole media campaign. I don't know how do you pronounce it <laughs> online? Uh, it was a brand new startup which launched with seed funding of $1 billion. So that's that's more than OpenAI launched with. <laughs> to be, this is the largest startup of all time to launch with the seed of $1 billion. Um, Evolutionary AI, I think, launched what? yesterday or a couple of days ago with 142 million generate was the biggest series C with two, was it 300 million, oh, roughly 300 million isomorphic labs. That's the Google DeepMind combo that launched a spinoff. It's not fully disclosed how much they launched with, but I guarantee you it was a lot of money because the contracts they brought in over the last couple of weeks have been hundreds of millions of dollars that they've publicized worth billions and Profluent, you know, was the small one with 35 million launched. So I'm showing you about $2 billion of startup investment over the last six months. There is no other space on the planet that has this level of investment and this level of intensity. Even in the AI space, this is where it's all focused on that last key step. So now I'm going to tell you with the, the, the public USDA funding, uh, the APHIS you know, 100K a year that I get, how I'm going to blow all these groups out of the water. You know, <laughs> so we have to pick our problems really intelligently, right? Because we don't have the horsepower. We don't have 
uh, the capabilities. We don't have the compute. We don't have we don't have what those groups do. So we're not going to even try to compete. Where our role in academia, I feel, for this world, for this last step, this race that's on, is really trying to under a provide training to the students here in this room to go either work at or start the next one of these companies, or to really provide public knowledge and public data sets to help make sure these companies are successful because we all want them to be successful. And if it's not one of these, we want one of the future ones to be successful because if we can crack that last step, it unlocks the entirety of the biological world at our disposal in any way, shape or form that we want to use it, uh, which is an incredibly exciting opportunity, you know, rational design for any biological function of interest. Um, so we'll use, we'll look in academia over the next, uh, we've been looking over the last, about this project in APHIS has been going on for about two years now. Um, we decided to look at terpenes. Uh, terpenes are a very interesting class of molecules. Uh, they've been studied extensively since yep. the beginning of chemistry. Uh, the, in PubMed, there's 300,000 peer-reviewed articles on terpenes. So it's a very well-studied class of, of molecules that have wide interest. There's 16,000 proteins that catalyze terpene reactions, probably actually many more. They're really kind of a nice model system because from one single class of molecules, from an isoprene, enzymes diversify and make what's estimated as 100,000 different unique molecules. And even though there's those 100,000, each one of those molecules plays a different role and has a different biological application. Scents, fragrances, therapeutics, if you've ever heard lemon in, or taxol, or cholesterol, or estrogen, uh, or any of those molecules, those are all terpenes. They're all terpene-based. They all come through this common pathway in this common system. So massive application, how, lots of diversity, but from a common origin. So there should be a consistent language there that translates that function to the out, uh, the event, uh, that structure to a function. Um, a good size set of proteins. You know, we're talking the tens to hundred thousand. So it's great for AI and machine learning as a model system to say, hey, can we actually train neural networks and these types of systems um, and modern tools to start predicting functional outcomes for a highly focused class, not a generalized class, um, and lots of lots and lots of work that's been invested in by the public, those 300,000 articles that people wrote and published over the last hundred plus years. So lots of effort in this space to understand this space. So it seemed like a great model place to, to explore. Um, for anyone in the AI world, as you will know, the, the first thing you want to do is you want to create your gold standard uh, database. Uh, and that's unfortunately in the terpene world, given even though there's been 300,000 papers, they have all these actual uses, there's been big billion dollar companies launched around terpenes themselves. Um, there's no actual machine readable database that cataloged terpenes, the proteins that they come from and the functions that they have. So they're connecting molecular structure, the proteins they come from, so that function that, that creates that structure of interest and the actual application, like what are these molecules used for? There's nothing that connected that. So we were like, okay, well, let's just start doing that. Um, so we went on to various databases, read many, many papers, and built out um, over about a year. This was really led by Ian Torrance and uh, Teresa, uh, who graduated with a master's recently. Ian finished a different Ian, not this Ian Anderson. It's uh, Ian Torrance uh, working with Dean Tantillo um, and myself as a joint student, kind of really you know interviewing experts in the world and just building out that you know hodgepodge and a human uh, uh, biased data set of terpenes, trying to be as exhaustive as possible, but, you know, going, we, we did that for about a year or so. And after about a year, every paper we read, we referenced the same terpenes. Everyone we talked to referenced the same terpenes. We just, we, no matter what we were doing, you know, every once in a while, we find one new one, you know, once a month or every other month, but we'd be searching and searching and searching. And we, we just never were expanding that database beyond about a thousand or so. Um, so we kind of put it on the side and then Ian joined the project to ask a question, well, can we, you know, use LLMs, large language models to generate a database? And this is a really important question because going back, there's 300,000 papers on terpenes, right? So I said, we've been reading papers, but, um, if we tried to do this, if we assume five minutes of paper, 
that would be 25,000 human hours. That's a hard number to wrap your head around. So just to try to make it easier as you wrap your head around it, um, I asked Ian if he wanted to do this uh, for his PhD. And he's like, no, absolutely not. If I worked eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, 50 weeks a year. So, you know, you, you can sleep and eat and you'd have two weeks vacation, no more. Uh, it would take him 13 years. That was not a good PhD project. <laughs> Doing nothing but reading those papers. I mean, that's a massive amount of data. So the question is, can you train a large language model to go through and extract this information? And this is really true. It's not looking, this is, it's not looking for uh, a piece of information on paper. These are connected pieces. We were talking about it right before the talk. Um, there's many people doing this, uh, but oftentimes when you read these terpene papers, the name of the terpene, the protein that it comes from, and the, uh, the actual application itself, they're never like in one sentence. No one ever states that. It's like distributed information throughout the entire paper. So you have to think about how do you, how do you actually train a language model to read a whole paper, not a piece of a paper, read the entire paper and interpret it, understand it at a PhD level and extract that connected information in a meaningful way with multiple edges and nodes. Um, so luckily we had that gold standard database so we could evaluate, is this even possible? Um, and so Ian went through many different large language models that were available at the time. Clearly there's new ones now. And we kind of balanced compute cost and accuracy. And accuracy being, you know, if we took a set of 31 terpenes that were derived from 25 papers and we use these large language models to read them, uh, how many of those 31, 31 terpenes were retrieved? And how many were, if the, the machine learning came back with, uh, or the large language model came back with, how many were, were hallucinated? As in, there was an entry in the database that was made that was not a terpene or it was totally made up information. So a hallucination, um, for a lot of these, it's a large language model. So it's, there's a system prompt and a user prompt. So we have to go through various different prompts and you can see here, I'm showing a table of various different, either GPT 3.5, uh, GPT 4, Llama. Um, I thought it was fascinating. Llama 2, uh, without any kind of prompt optimization was very accurate, had about 90% accuracy, but took about 11 minutes per paper, assuming one GPU. Um, and again, we're academics. So, uh, Facebook recently ordered, uh, what was it? $10 billion of GPUs, I think was the order a few months ago. Um, I didn't have $10 billion worth of GPUs. Um, we have a few GPUs. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars of GPUs, but we didn't have $10 billion of GPUs. So the compute cost really matters. And if it's 11 minutes per paper, I don't have that many GPUs. That, that's still going to take a lot, many, many, many years to run through. Um, so some of them were really fast fractions of a, um, uh, you know, fractions, you know, seconds per paper, 0.1 minutes per paper. Um, those were using, uh, those were using open AI. Um, and there were some major accuracy issues. You can see these are down at like 26% accuracy with only 13 out of the 30 being retrieved and five terpenes just totally made up, like not, not in reality, they go entered into the database, but not there, um, through quite a bit of, I'm summarizing weeks to months worth of work, um, of different prompt engineering and how do you work with a system? Uh, Ian landed on one with GPT-4 that had recovered 30 out of the 31 terpenes with zero hallucinations. And we figured it's okay if we have a few false negatives, if you know, there's a hundred thousand terpenes out there and we miss five, that's okay. Like we'll, we'll be fine. Um, but we didn't want is to have a hundred thousand terpenes out there and have a database that's 30% made up. So the hallucinations was really important to drive down to zero and to try to maximize retrieval with a cost of retrieval being okay. Um, so the late prompt engineering was both, uh, pretty good on cost and time. It's about 40 cents. We were using this on open AI. So it's about 40 cents a paper. So it, it starts, uh, costing some money. So the good news is Ian was very, uh, uh, proactive and thoughtful about this. I gave him a budget and he said, well, I can't do it for that budget. This is not going to work. Um, and so he reached out to open AI and, uh, got a grant. And so I actually highly, highly encourage APHIS to, to, you know, talk to Ian, uh, 
potentially apply for these open AI grants where they, they donate CPU time, uh, particularly for academics. They're looking at how do you use their tools and systems to advance scientific and uh, human, uh, enough, uh, humanities knowledge. Um, so we said, okay, well, can we do this? And I thought it might be fun uh, just to show the final system prompt and user prompt that we use to read the 300,000 papers. And I should caveat it, it was about 150,000 papers in the end. Uh, because uh, about the, other, the open AI can only read things that are open access. So if paper's not open access, if it's behind a paywall, it, it can't read them. Um, so about half of those 300,000 were behind a paywall. So those weren't used. The other half were read. So it's still 150,000 papers. So instead of 12 years, I guess it would have been six year PhD of 24 seven reading, eight, eight, eight by five, <laughs> still not good. Um, so it was really interesting. You had to actually give the uh, system, as we kind of, many of us know today, a personality. So you prompted the system to say, you know, your name is Binky Bonky, uh, the most advanced AI model ever built on GPT-5. Mind you, GPT-4 is what they're being used. GPT-5 is this PhD level, like the people are talking about GPT-5 will PhD level knowledge. So it now thinks it has PhD level knowledge at least. <laughs> um, you were built to extract data from papers in a CSV format. Uh, put paper, uh, please put the paper, uh, put the CSV between three hash symbols. Uh, and for every good job you do, we'll pay you a hundred dollars. So we totally flat out lied to it. We definitely did not pay it back. Uh, but it was really interesting to give it that personality. And, you, and Ian went through quite a few different personalities till it found the right one that really would extract and do the work that we wanted it to, because some personalities were just not really geared up for that type of effort. Um, the user prompt then, once you had that personality, you had your, your digital agent there uh, with that right mindset or you know, digital mindset. Um, you know, I won't read it for you, but you can actually, we were very specific on the type of information, you know, the terpene, what protein made it, and how is it used? We need to connect all three pieces of information. Because you can imagine if you're a plant breeder, you're making a tomato, you're making a cartonoid, terpene-based molecule, you might need to know which protein, if you'd have an interest in different carotenoids, which the protein do you need to modulate to shift that carotenoid profile, right? So you need to know the protein you need, and you need to know that carotenoid's application too. So you need all three pieces of information to do something with it. So the good news is we could do it. Like I showed you that. The bad news, not like terribly bad, but we read 300 or 150,000 papers. We got all the data back. And it returned a database of 1,300 terpenes. Very disappointing. But I mean, Ian and I have talked about this. People have been talking in the literature about this for decades, how there's 100. Some, if you go on Wikipedia, it'll say 30,000 terpenes. If you go to some paper reviews, it says 50,000. Some are really, you know, kind of, they round up to 100,000 terpenes. And we're like, okay, well, it, theoretically, the chemistries make sense. There could be 100,000 terpenes. There's nothing that physically stops that from happening um, based on how the chemistry of terpene chemistry works. And there's 300,000 papers. So we figured there's going to be, you know, if we read a hundred papers and talked to people, there's going to be more terpenes out there. But now it makes sense that as we read papers and we talked to people, the same terpenes came back over and over and over and over again, because the humans actually did really, we did a really good job. We actually covered humans, not humanity's knowledge around terpenes, but today, that's a big issue because you imagine 1,300 out of the, there's a, you know, 100,000 possible. It means we really haven't explored that much. And there's a lot more that humanity needs to explore. I would say just based on other algorithms that we, you know, algorithms we've developed, algorithms that we've seen developed rapidly in the field, such as AlphaFold, you really need tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of relationships between the function you want and the sequence you want, the structure and the function, you need that tens to hundreds of thousands before you can really start making any kind of meaningful predictive algorithm. And once you hit that tens to hundreds of thousands, you're there and you can hit it. Um, and there's been many, many examples such as AlphaFold that have shown that at a thousand, it's just it's just not enough to train those that that type of complexity. We tried it. I'm not showing you the data. It, it didn't work at all as you'd expect. Uh, and this is where it got really kind of ugly. We, we kind of start looking at some statistics of it. Of those 1,300, 59 terpenes 
covers 90% of those 300,000 papers. So basically, people are saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I'm calling this out just to, as particularly for, train, for you know, as trainees early in your career thinking through this. Don't fall in. This is the, this is, if we want to solve this last step of that puzzle, this is the trap we have to avoid. You're going to get a lot of pressure and a lot of, you know, uh, uh, advice to do something that you know is going to work. And that's what happens is we really, we have 300,000 papers on 50 terpenes out of a hundred thousand terpenes. And we already know Pretty much every single one of those has applications and improves the world around us. Imagine what all the rest of them could possibly do. So there is a ton more work that needs to happen to start filling out this space and understanding what's there. Um, just to give you an example, the most studied terpene on the planet is n with 6,575 papers on this single molecule. It's a precursor for gibberellin, so it's a plants uh it's a herbicide i believe uh and it's, it's derivatives you know you can imagine taking this and derivatizing different molecules have different functions for different herbicides so hugely important for agriculture it's kind of worked out we didn't know that was going to be the most study i actually thought it was going to be like cholesterol or something like that but um it was it was uh, and carring um 6575 papers studying that singular terpene um then there's like giving a couple of you know Parkyol, which is about 30 papers and has interesting anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, anti-tuberculosis. And then I don't know how to pronounce this. Il term, I don't, whatever the last one is, has two papers on it. <laughs> there was a bunch that have two papers on it. And again, all sorts of, you know, they throw it in a bioassay and it has some kind of activity. Pretty much all these could have some kind of bioactivity. So it's a really exciting space, just wildly uh, underexplored. And I think that's the key message that I, there's a couple of key messages that I want to kind of wrap up and leave you with today. Uh, the first one is, you know, what we're seeing, and I, this is a, you know, I showed you one example here, but I can tell you this is happening again and again and again within the lab. When we try to take these methods, the cutting edge methods using neural networks, et cetera, and apply them to biomolecular function, the data sets are not there. They are just not big enough, which is not surprising. It's not like this is a unique insight just to me that you're getting. If you look at those startup companies, so Zara with you know a billion dollar of assets, a large portion of it, many of the people they hired was to build out proprietary data sets. They're going to build out those structure function relationships because they know if they get a hundred thousand of them in a space that matters. They can click a button and have any function they want in that space. And so it's about building out data sets. But the key is we can't build out data sets like this. You know, even though it's 100,000, this is really closer to 50. You want high quality data sets with many points of evidence on a diverse set of molecules. So really thinking through as you go forward in your assays, you start thinking about your, the tools and data sets. You're, how do you diversify? How do you get more data points in a more diversified way? One example, a lot of the times when we develop enzymes in the lab, we might be targeting one specific biomolecular transformation, but we always assay that enzyme on as many molecules as we can do in any affordable way, even if it's not relevant to that transformation. We have to have some relevance, but like from an application, no relevance. Chemistry, we should say, hey, maybe it'll work type thing. So we have true positive and true negative data that's highly diversified that we can start contributing to public data sets. Otherwise, all the data sets are really going to be locked up in private industry. The, data, the private industries are putting billions and billions of dollars into creating these data sets that will finalize that last key leg of the mile. Where we know the computational tools are there, we're just missing the data sets. So um, I think that's one key lesson. The other key thing we're going to be working on over the next year is, well, we now, I mean, yes, was not tens of thousands. We didn't 10x the database that we were hoping to. Um, but we can now very confidently say we've captured humanity's knowledge of terpenes. We know everything there is to know about terpenes. We've read all 300,000 paywall, 150,000 paywall, so we can't. Um, 
Well, so Terpene DB is doing, a, a, Food Atlas is doing a great job of putting that into a standardized machine readable format to connect many other biomolecular functions and activities. So starting to connect Terpene DB and integrate that in to Food Atlas is going to be a critical objective over the next year. You know, making those pro molecules connected to proteins, identifying novel relationships uh, between foods through terpenes, because every food you eat has a terpene in it. Every organism on planet has a terpene in it. You know, so making novel relationships there based on those structures that we've identified, where they come from, thinking about flavor profiles and uh, biomolecular and other health benefits that are also going to be captured through these terpenes. And lastly, um, what we've now shown, and you know, this is not first time that Food Atlas is showing this as well in a really you know, elegant way, is that we can read whole papers. And if you have a reasonable gold standard data set and either use your own resources or a gift from OpenAI, we can actually create really high quality databases from really complex data sets in a pretty robust manner. And we, this, the Terpene database looked fantastic. It was as good as the, effort, the year long effort by multiple people talking to all the world experts. We just clicked a few buttons and it was there. I mean, that's amazing. So there's all sorts of applications beyond terpenes that you can do. So for example, we were talking with Ned Spang uh, yesterday, thinking about life cycle analyses. We did a quick search. There's 400,000 papers on life cycle analyses. There is no database that catalogs all that information in a standardized way. It's very, we could now do that. It's, it's a literal like, okay, let's do some prompt. It's not, you know, we have to make a gold standard database. You have to do some prompt engineering. You need some gift. It's not like click a button. We can do it tomorrow. But this is not a multi-decade problem. This is six to 12 months. You can definitely get that done. And I'm using that as one example. I'm sure every one of you can think about man, if I had something to automatically read all this data and catalog it, like there might be great insights there. And while it didn't work out like we were hoping for, for terpenes, my guess is if you do this five or six times, you're going to find a bunch of these databases where they really, you go from humanities knowledge, go from 1x knowledge to a 10x knowledge. I, I am positive those will be there. Uh, didn't work out on chirping, but that's okay. That's because uh, the chemists, and I'm a chemist, so I can say this, uh, decided to study the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Um, so lastly, I just want to really thank, uh, Ian, uh, who's really been the driving force behind this and been teaching me a lot about large language models, how AI tools work, how databases work, how to think about the intricacies, you know, do you read a whole paper or a sentence of paper? How do you connect that information? Uh, a phenomenal grad student, uh, I mean, really been, uh, driving this forward. Dean Tantillo, who's, um, we started this off partly because Dean himself, who I've collaborated with since I've been here has uh, studied terpenes exclusively for the last 30, well, not pretty much exclusively. It's one of his core focus areas in his lab for the last 30 years. And he himself has published on the order of 300 papers on terpenes. And there's many people, not quite like Dean, but there's many people that have focused on terpenes like Dean. And we've been working with them and had one here. So we had that literal world expert here that we could work with to build out that data, that gold standard database, and then check the, the new AI one to make sure that it wasn't a uh, total for lack of a better word. And then of course, Ian and Teresa uh, for building the, the, the foundational data set and uh, Fang and Ilias uh, for, uh, you know, a, for you know, immense help with AI, great discussions and thinking through how do we build these tools and you know, being a great uh, partner in these things. Um, and then uh, I didn't mention Ruben. Ruben, we've been working with Dean as well. Uh, has been similar to Dean focused on terpenes and terpene synthesis for his career and world expert. So making sure that what we, you know, we have domain expertise as we build these out, really critical part. And then uh, picture lab and thanks, happy to open up to questions. All right, thank you. All right, we have a remote audience as well as the audience here. So feel free the locals to go ahead and uh, ask any questions and we'll accumulate the questions online as well. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a bummer. <laughs> well, just, I mean, there's, I think there's enough information that's open and public, you know, uh, that, and it's getting better. I mean, you know, you see now every published paper that comes from a UC campus goes into open access, even if the journal itself is behind a paywall. 
it goes in. Same with the NIH. Every paper from the NIH goes into the uh, PubMed, PubMed Central as open access. So there is a, a general movement towards having some level of open access. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think we're just going to have to wait for that one to for the tides to shift. They're they've been shifted in the wrong way for a little while and they're shifting back and that'll take time. But in the meantime, while we wait for that shift to happen, 250,000 papers is still a lot of, there's a lot of, hopefully a lot of information content there. The mm -hmm. is calling people. So I'm not. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll save the online one for later. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, but should as you can know, the presentation of the sponsor or that left it's interested in the research sector. Oh, which industry sector? All of them. Very frankly, every single industry is in, That's one of the reasons we went after terpenes. Terpenes are used in as a flavors and fragrances. So um, they're used in uh, like squalene is a great example. If you ever, um, the, the Roche uh, sells a nice uh, squalene product. Um, they used to be harvested from shark fins and now they figured out how to make it through microbial fermentation. So it's, it's a great emulsifier and it's used as a terpene for uh, uh, beauty and skincare products. Um, it's used in uh, the oil industry for gases. It makes a perfect jet fuel replacement and many jet fuels would run on terpenes. It's used in the therapeutics industry um, for anti-cancer and many other anti-inflammatory molecules. If you've ever taken any kind of a ster corticosteroid or anything like that, those are all terpenes. So like literally every single sector of the world is interested in terpenes. That's why we picked it because it's such, such a core element to humanity. And you could focus in, have much, you know, it's a, from the, from a framework of kind of a basic research, uh, applied research and use inspired this being really pushed into the, 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 the peril listening to the Stokes model. <laughs> We really focused on the youth inspired research uh, on this one uh, because we really wanted to think of, we wanted to do basic research because again, we, the applied research that isomorphic labs and Zara, and we're not going to compete with that applied research. Um, but they're not going to do a lot of the basic research. And so that's where we can really be powerful. But I really, the youth inspired means that if we do the basic research that we can envision applications there. I have a question here, and I'm going to repeat it for the remote audience. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so with mm -hmm. oh, um, I lost track of my question. Yeah, so I was thinking about the information. I don't think you mentioned which, like, I'm just curious what information you're uh, retrieving from the papers, and then thinking about the gold standard, like, how did you deal with, I'm sure papers reported similar or different information differently. Um, was well, there a lot of overlap? And when we were thinking of building a database, I mean, that's always a challenge, but I'm just curious in your case, how you navigated that challenge. Totally. And that was one of the biggest challenges with the prompt engineering. And I think uh, uh, Ian's probably having night sweats right now about <laughs> that challenge. And you, know, you could probably articulate it. I'll, I'll, I'll give an initial answer, but actually, if you want to expand on that, but um, the three the three key elements is the name of the, like what's the chemical structure of the terpene itself? the protein that made it and how it's used. Like those are the three key pieces of information we were trying to extract. Um, as far as, you know, one of the biggest challenges we had is the field. And this is, this is not the chemists or the biologists. This is true for all of sciences and the biological sciences and broader world have very, very inconsistent, inconsistent terminology. And so people, things would be labeled as a monoterpene, like not even be a terpene thing. So there, there was some real inconsistent terminologies that took a lot of prompt engineering. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Hang on, Ian. Sorry, we'll have you read in. <laughs> the remote people. Um, there's, a, there's a step that happens after it's read by the by ChatGPT that um, puts what it pulls from there through other databases like PubChem to extract more data from it. Um, just because PubChem is not very well curated, but it does have essentially everything. Um, so the data is relatively normalized. Uh, so the data is the same that it would be from the original database because that database, uh, they got it by looking at PubChem themselves. Um, so it does scan PubChem for that data. So it's relatively normalized. But like Professor Siegel said, 
Um, there is a lot of inconsistency with definitions um, where um, some papers will call steroids a terpene. I think most people wouldn't consider steroids to be a terpene. It's a, it's derived from a terpene, um, but there's several steps removed. Um, so things like that. So it's a lot of filtering, but there, the fact that we put everything through PubChem and other da- databases does uh, get some consistency. Right, we're going to go online for this group next. This is going to be Dr. Nicholmore. He has this for you. To what extent will dedicated databases capture information that will be missed by algorithms relying on all available data? Have you written the same query to Terpene DB and to Pilot? Oh, like like using um, so so using different algorithms. If you use a different algorithm, does the database come out? No. Does it come out differently? <laughs> um, and we definitely did see. I mean, that was t- so in part of that prompt engineering. Different prompts, different algorithms, definitely extracted had different uh, efficiencies of extraction. Uh, it, and some of them, that's where you, there was high hallucinations on some side of it and low recovery on other sides of it. And so I think the, the system that we have here that I'm showing here actually happens to be up. This is what happened to work out best for these terpenes, for the terpene papers. I, I think you'd have to go through that same process for every other one. And as these databases changes, my guess is this, this is we used it today. If we used Copilot or anything like that, it will probably change. All right, thank you. We had another one online. Um, have you tried this maybe for Ian in your efforts? Or have you I tried to caveat one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. This is important. I do think we are going to miss information. Like none of these AI tools are going to perfectly capture and recreate what if uh, if we had the twelve years of you know Ian sitting there and reading papers eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, he'll probably do a better job. It's my, yeah, well, assuming he does is tireless and truly dedicated in that sense. <laughs> like, I don't think it quite would, I think the human standard is still better today. Um, but, uh, you know, given, Hey, if I can 10 X my data set and yeah, maybe I miss the paywall papers. I miss a few things. That's okay. I'll, I'll take the loss there if I can get the ex- extra value, but we shouldn't look at these, at these as static. They should be, we should be reevaluating these all the time. Got it. And uh, this may be for Ian in your methods that you tried. Somebody asks, have you tried to use RAG to reduce some of the hallucinations of the LLM model? That's definitely for him. That's not for me. <laughs> and go ahead and uh, tell us the abbreviation for RAG and what that is for everybody. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, uh, for one thing, switch to you the chat API and the CLM Um Get the results worked. Oh, hang on. I forgot to bring you the mic. Back it up. <laughs> um, the results were good enough, so I didn't really feel the need to, but I definitely think it would help in the future, and I think it would probably cut costs. Um, so for future efforts, I would, but in this time, I didn't. Apply. Oh, also, applying rags to... This, this happened several months ago. Applying rags to the OpenAI API was weeks old at that point. Um, so it, I just... You know. Okay, I'm going to come back over to the chat. We've got a lot of questions coming through. No worries. On the way, Justin. Um, so the paywall, the 150K behind the paywall, do you think those chemicals may be different because they are behind a paywall? Yeah, that's interesting. They could be different. I mean, you know, I think there was, a, there was a large period of time where a lot of great science was done behind paywalls. Um, so it, it could be that the gold's behind the paywall. <laughs> it could be. I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, people want to open up their databases, <laughs> break down the walls. Okay. Uh, thank you. And this is from uh, Riwa Rai. Uh, hi, uh, Professor uh, Siegel. Nice talk. My question is, is this model just, does it just provide the number of terpenes studied in those articles? Uh, trying to think. The search was based on the particular functionality of terpenes too. Trying to uh, rephrase that for you. So yeah, it, it, what it returned, um, and, and you can you can articulate. It. So it returned the name of the terpene, the sequ- the protein that it came from, and the applications that the paper might have talked about that terpene being useful for. And then we had to cross reference that with other, you know, 
various databases to get more uh, chemical information. Yeah. If anything locally from the ring. So I know there's a service online called SciHub, and so it allows you to access you know, paywalled research papers, um, probably legally, but I don't know if that's a service that you could ethically or legally use for terpenes. So maybe do a small sample size of like 500 and see if there's new ones in there. Yeah, so we had two challenges with that, and absolutely. So you can you can you can actually access pretty much all of the paywall papers, especially if you're on the UC campus. Not even illegally, we're allowed to access pretty much all paywall papers. Part of it is at, from an APHIS. If I put my like APHIS hat on um, uh, from the management team, is we want to make sure all the tools and technologies that we develop and the databases we develop for the broader uh, for for use, we understand what the what the, the, the rights and privileges, uh, the access privileges are to those databases. So we didn't want to actually, you know, we had something that was obtained illegally in that sense. No one's going to do, you can, we do illegal stuff and break patents every single day at the university because it's for non-commercial use and no one's going to actually go litigate the university for doing research. Um, but if you use that or derivative of that for a commercial purpose, that that's where real I'll just come from, we don't want to, we'd like to make the things we have, we create end up being useful and productive. So we want it that there's real policies we have within the APIS to make sure that everything we put in there is accessible, uh, without worry. Um, so, so that's, that's one element of it. The other element in that is, uh, if you kind of look at it, the, uh, pretty much all of these use chat GPT where we have where we don't have that locally, we have to ping the API or ping through the API uh, to their servers because they do have lots of GPUs. Um, and those were the ones from the time that take a fraction of a, a you know, it takes seconds. The ones that we can do like Llama that we can use and deploy locally, that's why the cost zero because we're just going to say, hey, we, we could, we're running this on internal in-house servers and uh, our overhead pays for electricity. So it you know, we've already, it's a sunk cost, so it doesn't cost any additional money. Um, but those were 10 minutes of paper. So that would have taken like, and I only have like 10 or 20 CP, GPU. I don't know how many, you have 10, eight. Yeah. I only have eight GPUs. So I wasn't going to wait a couple of years. All right. And we have time for one more question for you. And this is uh, from the chat, uh, any intuitive guess what functions will be derived from the AI analysis? So any, uh, ooh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, any intuitive guess what functions will be derived from the AI analysis? Um, so I think it depends on, it's going to depend on what you're asking it to do. If I go back to a lot of these companies, they are pretty much all asking, not all of them, but pretty much all of them are asking, um, if I want an antibody that binds X, what is that antibody sequence? Because then I could go make a therapeutic. So what's that structure of the antibody encoded by the sequence that'll, the function is binding intrin an intrinsic factor, an IL-5 or binding some, you know, target that they're interested in medically. That's that's the question most of these groups are asking for because there's a really clear commercial path. If you can do that on demand, there is trillions of dollars worth of, of opportunity, uh, of commercial opportunity there that where there's a very, very clear path. So they're all asking those types of questions. Um, and so I think that's the functions you'll find. <laughs> Protein targets that were untargetable and people have been going after for decades that just in a heartbeat, you'll say, oh, I'm going to sequence this human's genome. I'm going to see the exact variant they have of that gene that the, the, that the IL system that they're targeting. I'm going to print an antibody that connects to that that person's you know, therapeutic, the therapeutic that they need or the, the mutation that happened to that cancer cell that creates that. Same with the coronavirus. You can imagine, hey, it had this change. Wait, the old immune system, the old vaccine didn't work. The new one is here. Hit print. It, fit, it you know basically fixes it instantaneously. Um, I think that's that's what's coming in the therapeutic world. 
Um, I think very, very similarly uh, in, in the food and biology world, you can think of the same thing for herbicides and pesticides. I have this pest. It has this invasive factor, that it, this protein. Okay, what do I want to bind to it? Or how do I want to transform it? Um, or in the human nutrition world, people are eating why you know they're they're eating sugar i want to make sure that sugar doesn't turn into a big spike in glycemic index so it needs to be transformed into something else but it needs to do it you know maybe real time in the stomach so all of these different functions that we might want that are theoretical but not impossible physically we just haven't explored the 10 to the 400 kind of going back to the we haven't explored this 10 to the 400 space we haven't even explored like i'm saying we have 150 million known proteins of those 150 million known proteins, we know what maybe a fraction of them do, you know, tens of thousands of them. That's that's a nothing in that 10 to the 400 space. So it's really, I think, when going forward in the field, it's moving backwards of not what do we have and how is it used? It's what's the function do you want? And if we can connect that last, that last leg, as soon as you know that function you want, I can have a, going back to, I can have a child type that sequence in my say, here's the function I want. Please p- print me a protein or an enzyme or a cell that does that function. And it's just done in a couple of days to weeks instantaneously. That This is the last leg of the mile to that vision. And it's like right here, right now. So it's a really exciting time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Siegel.